So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on the earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favour until supernatural strength floods your inmost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energises you. Now, we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. Father God, we thank you for that most amazing and inspiring passage. And Lord, we just ask now that you would um, come and fill each one of us again. Um, Father, that we would understand that amazing love. Lord, we ask for your anointing on you as she speaks, and we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us. And we offer up this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning and welcome to the Restore live stream today. Uh, my family and I are part of the Loughton congregation and um, the, being part of the Restore family has blessed us for many years. So it's really lovely to be able to speak to you live this morning. Uh, firstly, I'll start by thanking Malcolm and Emily and Albert and Lucy. They're fabulous. If you didn't tune in at 10.20 to catch the family slot, I really recommend you do that next week because they were fabulous this morning and I'm sure you can catch up with it on YouTube later if you missed it. But they were great. So 10.20 for the family slot. And so this week is week three of our Reframe series where we've been looking at the book of Ephesians and studying how Paul wants us to understand the salvation and love of God and huge endless grace that he has for us. And he writes about it in this letter. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you'll know that Paul is writing to Ephesus, a huge city where there is worship of Greek and Roman gods. And it's a difficult situation in which he is writing. In fact, he is under house arrest at the time that he writes this letter to the Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is essentially in two halves, although, of course, it's good to remember there were no chapter and verse divisions when it was first written. But the first half really covers the mystery and glory of God's grace and our salvation through the love of Jesus. And Jodie covered that um, when she talked about the grace of God. And for those of you that missed the acronym, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. And then Ian last week explored chapter two and uh, looked at the fact that actually the gospel is for both Jew and Gentile and that God promotes this multi-ethnic community. Something he reiterates in chapter 3. Paul writes in verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel 
the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul celebrates and worships God and everything that he has done for us. And we're considering today chapter 3 that Juliet so kindly read from the Passion Translation just a moment ago. The second half, chapters 4 to 6, go on to look at the impact of these eternal truths and how they affect our lives and the way that we live in today's world. But this morning, let's factor on chapter 3. Let's focus on chapter 3. So in this section, Paul is really in awe and wonder at the way God has included him in his ministry. Paul prays a fabulous prayer in the second half for his followers to be strengthened by God's spirit. For his people, Paul writes in very, very challenging circumstances that they would grasp and comprehend the love of God. Now, we may not be in prison right now, but I think for many of us, lockdown has felt a lot like being under house arrest. And actually, it's been really difficult. For some people, there's been real sadness and great uncertainty. And for a lot of us, that isn't going to end necessarily soon. The challenges that we'll continue to face as we come out of this time will be considerable. But Paul reminds us that even in our sufferings, God is at work and he has work for us to do. In fact, it's often in our sufferings that we see God's greatest work because when we are weak, God is strong. When we are at the end of our own natural resources, God shows up and does the incredible. When the circumstances seem stacked against us, That's when we can lean on the Father and enjoy his grace and his mercy and his provision. This knows no end. And when we lean on him and when we are weak, he can be revealed in all his glory. You see, scripture tells us that he'll never abandon us. He'll never forsake us because he loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And so today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you that are watching out there. Um, Can I apologize for the lack of chocolate that we would normally enjoy if we were together physically in a church building, but I'm gonna trust that your children have resolved that for you this morning. Um, We need to acknowledge that it's not an easy day for everyone. Earthly fathers actually should be a reflection of the heart of God, the Father heart of God. Strong, compassionate, protective, and good. But not everyone has that experience of an earthly father. For some, the love of their father may have to be earned. For others, maybe there was a distorted version of love. Or maybe that love was actually just absent, whether it was physically or emotionally. And if that's the case, then maybe we need to reframe our idea of the love of the Father this morning. Let's shape our idea of love from what the scriptures teach us about the Father's love and not the world's version of it. I was actually very blessed to have a wonderful, godly father, and I should say mother also, I had a double blessing. Um, they were full of love, full of sacrifice uh, for both myself and my brother. But even for me now, this day is a day of remembrance rather than celebration. My own dad died now 12 years ago, and actually it was a painful and seemingly premature death in our eyes. Whatever our experiences of an earthly father though, we can all celebrate the father's love this morning. 
And actually, some of you may be fathers yourself. But you realise that maybe you haven't done the job quite as well as you might have liked to. Maybe some of us are living with regret or guilt about how we've parented our own children. And believe me, from experience, there's a lot of mistakes to be made. There is no rule book. I wish there was. Um, but actually, no matter how good we've tried to be, we will have fallen short of the Father's perfect love. And it's that love that I want us to think about this morning. It's that Father. It's the Father who is the Father to the fatherless, the everlasting Father who knit us together in our mother's womb. A Father who Jesus himself calls Abba. That term of affection, that daddy. And actually when he teaches the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he actually invites us to address our Father God in the same way, not authoritarian, not standoffish, just daddy, because he loves us so much and with the affection and intimacy of a daddy. So it's this love that Paul refers to in verses 17 and 18 and what he's desperate for us to understand. It says this, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Or as the Passion Translation puts it, then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Paul desires us to be rooted and established in love, the love of the Father, that we would comprehend that this is a love born of grace, not earned, certainly not deserved, but that we don't have to depend on our performance and that actually we can enjoy a father's embrace, regardless of how many times we've got it wrong. No matter how many times we think we've fallen short, haven't been quite worthy of it, the good news is that the father's love doesn't have the limits and the conditions that we put on our own. Let's reframe our love in light of the father's love. So Paul himself, I love the character of Paul. Paul and Peter, they're everybody's favourites, aren't they? Because we can all relate to, you know, having a, a bit of a messed up background and then being able to sort it out or equally just being so eager to, to please that you're constantly getting it wrong. And Paul, I love Paul, because actually he knew only too well of the father's love. During his time as Saul, he was a devout and educated Jew. And he was responsible for the persecution of many, many Christians. And we know from Acts chapter 8 that he's there giving his consent as Stephen is stoned and becomes our first martyr. We know that he was throwing women and children into prison, and the men, <laughs> the whole shebang. And as he was doing that, I'm sure he believed it was a godly thing to do but he'd so missed the mark. And actually following his conversion and his name change, Paul acknowledges many times his inadequacies and his past behaviours. And in verse 8 of today's passage, it says, Although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. The Father does not wait for us to be worthy of his love or acceptance. In so many ways, that is countercultural. We might like to think that we love unconditionally and generously and all of those things, but in reality, we live in a world where we are rewarded on merit and love is often conditional on our behaviours, our appearance, our performance. Thankfully, the love of the Father does not have these limitations. 
Paul writes of his own experience of the Father's love in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'll let you look at that at your leisure. But there is a theologian, Tom Wright, who puts it like this. God has taken the wildest, most violent of blaspheming persecutors and has transformed him into not only a believer, but also a trusted apostle and evangelist. If God can do that, there is nobody out there, no heart so hard, no anger so bitter, that it remains outside the reach of God's patient mercy. Wow. Wow, I love that. No heart so hard, no anger so bitter, that it's outside the reach of God's patient mercy. The father is relentless in the pursuit of his children. We can never be so far from God that he isn't desperately wanting us to return to him. So perhaps the most famous parable in scripture when it comes to the love of the father is of course the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15. A story where the younger son has insulted his father by asking for his inheritance long before the father is in the grave. And he goes off and he squanders it on fast living. And he enjoys the high life, but eventually the funds run out and he finds himself living in squalor. He's living amongst the pigs. He's destitute. And in desperation, he finally realises that just maybe if he returned home, just maybe his father might employ him as a servant in his very wealthy household. Imagine him, the younger son, probably dressed in his dungarees, shabby, <laughs> shabby, dishevelled. And there he is, deciding, and I'm sure it wasn't an easy decision, but deciding to go home, just in the hope that there might be a job and a meal for him there. And yet, we know that when the father sees his son from a distance, he runs to him. He runs to him. And this in itself was not an action seen by a man in such a position as his. Now, I don't know about you, but lockdown has um, it's done some funny things to us, hasn't it? And uh, our viewing patterns seem to have changed during lockdown. I've for a number of years, been a fan of Downton Abbey. How can you not love Downton Abbey? Um, but my husband has taken a little bit of persuading and has never really bought into it until a couple of weeks ago, um, just by surprise, I think he was just trying to be really sweet, we settled down to watch the TV and series one, episode one of Downton Abbey appears on the screen. Well, he's, he's got me now. It's like, it's like that moment in the film, you had me at hello, he had me at Downton. <laughs> so we're there. And we're all snuggled in. And do you know what? In the last two weeks, I'm not even sure I should confess this, but we have binged the whole six series. In fact, we finished it just last night. So don't, we have, we've still got the movie to go. So like, don't spoil anything. Nothing on the chat, please. Um, but actually, <laughs> it is, it's great, is what it is. But how rare is it to see anybody running? You see, in Downton Abbey, they're respectable, they're wealthy, they're lords and ladies. They don't run anywhere. Thinking I should be a lady, I don't run anywhere either. Um, <laughs> the reality is, that's beneath them. And here we have the father whose son has been away, who's squandered it all, and when he sees him, he runs. He doesn't care what he looks like. He's just desperate to get to his son. Verse 20 describes the scene. He swept him up 
in his arms, hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with tender love. Is that our image of the Father God this morning? Because if it's not, we need to reframe it. The son, of course, tries to explain and ask for a job, but the father, he's not interested. He doesn't even give him chance to get the words out. Instead of a job, he offers him a feast. Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate, for this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found. As the father dresses his son in the best that he has, he's reinstating him as his child and as his heir. No expense is spared. The love is lavish, demonstrative. He hugged him, he kissed him. There was no two meter rule. <laughs> and he just embraces his son. Jesus paints it as a wonderful picture of the father's heart and the joy of his children returning to him. But then of course, there's the older brother who we can never ignore in this story. And verse 28 tells us that he's less than impressed with his response as the father has welcomed back the brother. Verse 28 says, The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, Come and enjoy the feast with us. The son explains that he's not happy about the situation because actually he's been there all the time. He's done everything that was ever asked of him and he can't remember the last time his dad threw a party for him. But the father calms him and says, my son, you are always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate like this and be overjoyed because this brother of yours was once dead and gone but now he is alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he is found. The older son feels unjustly treated. He's been faithful and loyal to his father, and he's angry that his brother, who deserves so little, has been welcomed back with so much. It rather reminds me of another passage in Matthew chapter 20, where we see the workers in the vineyard. The workers have worked hard all day and are paid what they are owed. And yet some other workers only turned up for the last part of the day, but they're paid the same. The workers who did a full day's work are angry that this should be the case. It seems terribly unfair, rather like the feelings of the older brother. And if we're honest, maybe we have some sympathy with those workers in the field. Maybe sometimes things just don't seem fair. The father's response, though, to the brother is not to leave him outside having a sulk. And to be honest, if I was dealing with the older brother, that might well have been like, like, just sort yourself out when you can be bothered, when you're ready, come back in, ignore him, any number of responses. But he doesn't. He goes out and he pleads with him to come in and join the party. In fact, he reminds the older brother that all he has is his. But that should not take away from the joy of his younger brother returning home. In that moment, the father wants the older brother 
to join in the celebration at his brother's homecoming. In terms of the workers in the vineyard, they are so concerned with what seems to be an unfair payment that they miss the generosity of the employer. Are we more concerned with it seeming unfair or more focused on the fabulous generosity and grace of God as he continually reaches out to us? You see, the workers are not shortchanged. They've worked for what they earned and for what they'd agreed, and actually they've been paid in full. But what they were unable to do was celebrate the grace that was shown to others. And so it is with the Father's love. It's not earned or deserved, and it will not be withdrawn for poor behaviour or bad choices. It's given to us by the grace that Paul writes about through Ephesians. And that love is available to all. Whether they've worked for one hour or ten, whether they've served faithfully their whole lifetime, or whether they've come to the Father in their final hours. We cannot want grace for ourselves and justice for others. We must be agents of love and grace and not just the recipients of it. There's no limit to the relentless love of the father in pursuit of his children. We see it again and again in scripture. We see it in the lost sheep in Matthew chapter 18 where the shepherd leaves the 99. I mean, who does that? But he leaves the 99. Can you imagine if you were at school? I'm a teacher, but can you imagine if she's like, I've lost one child. Oh, I'll just leave all the others and go and find the one. No, you'd go and get help and you'd call for somebody else to go. But no, the shepherd leaves his 99 because he is desperate to search for that one sheep. With the lost coin, where the owner is searching high and low in desperation. In all of these stories, God is the instigator. He is always looking for us. This picture of an affectionate, passionate God needs to replace any notions we have of some remote, distant, unaffectionate, judgmental father. Knowing God as Father is not theology. It's an experience of a real, unwavering love. Jesus himself prays in John 17 that his followers would see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. He says that in verse 23. But then in case we miss it the first time, he says it again, slightly differently in verse 26. He says, I will continue to make you even more real to them so that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me. The same endless love that you have for me. Wow. Did you realise that God the Father loves you and me as much as he loved Jesus himself? Let's just take a minute because that can be head knowledge, but do we know it in our heart? Do we really know that God the Father loves me, loves you, as much as he loves Jesus himself? The good, the bad, the ugly, he loves us. And why does this matter so much? Well, because actually Paul says we're to be rooted and established in this love before anything else. When we're able to grasp the Father's love in all its fullness, then we're able to live from love, not for love. We're able to live from approval, not for approval. From acceptance and not for acceptance. When we live from this love, we can celebrate God's grace for all people. When we think about the older brother, I think deep down, he was worried. He didn't understand how much his father truly loved him. He felt perhaps threatened by the return 
of the younger brother. We need to be rooted and established in the Father's love so that we don't need to feel challenged or threatened. We can be who we were made to be because God loves us as we are. We live from this love and we're able to celebrate God's grace. Right back at the beginning, Abraham acknowledged that he was blessed to be a blessing. We are loved to love. Many years ago, I heard a preach and a phrase has stayed with me always afterwards. And the phrase was simply that love is a verb. Love is a verb, it's a doing word. When God loved us, he sent Jesus. Love is a doing word. And God the Father has initiated and run to us throughout history. But we're not called simply to bask in this love. We're called to act on it. And we're called to love others. Not in an ideological or fluffy way, but in a doing way. And there's been many great examples of that actually during this season of lockdown. Communities looking after each other, people supporting one another in ways that perhaps we haven't seen for a long time in our society. But as believers, rooted and established in the Father's love, let's be at the forefront of loving others. The Father loved us when we gave him no cause to. We love because he first loved us. And when we're rooted and established in that love, we are liberated to love others and make a difference in the world around us. So finally, be encouraged, because actually the world right now may not seem like a particularly loving or gracious place, but actually I doubt it did to Paul either. Remember his circumstances when he wrote the book of Ephesians. He concludes, as we will today, with this prayer. To him who is able to do immeasurably more, than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>